Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The hymns with the doxological stanzas, those little, uh, where, where we have the doxology, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, praise be to God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're marked with that little triangle. And I always sort of thought of that as, as the Lutheran version of jazzercise. Boy, on, on a day like today for the Feast of St. Matthew, when you have so many doxological stanzas, it feels like you're, you're standing up and you're sitting down and you're standing up and you're sitting down. But think of how many calories you're burning in the Lord's name. This is a, this is a truly wonderful thing. And today is indeed a wonderful day because it is the day the church recalls St. Matthew, the apostle, the evangelist, and the martyr of the faith. And certainly he is a great man, worthy of being remembered and worthy of being called a saint. And that is how the church remembers Matthew. And that's how you and I do. But how did Matthew remember himself? Was it Matthew the disciple? Was it Matthew the apostle? No, Matthew uses two words to describe himself, to remember who he is, tax collector. Now to the ears of the first century, these words, tax collector, meant that someone was a vile and horrible person, a liar, a cheat, a thief, a traitor to their own people, for they worked for these occupiers, these foreigners from Rome who now governed their land. Tax collectors would overcharge for taxes, skimming a little bit off the top and lining their pockets with the hard-earned money of others. They enjoyed the fat of the land while their brothers and sisters toiled. Yes, to be a tax collector was to be a miserable, miserable human being. And that is how Matthew has remembered himself. Now what Mark and Luke gloss over by saying Matthew, when they list the 12 disciples, they mention him only by name. But Matthew, Matthew does differently. And there are two people in Matthew's gospel whom he points out with special mention. Judas, who betrayed Christ, and Matthew, the tax collector. You see, Matthew was honest about who he was, honest with himself and honest with us in his gospel, his gospel that is preserved to this day. And it isn't because of false humility or even a kind of self-loathing. And it certainly isn't because his sins were not forgiven. He knows they are. And that's the very point of his gospel, that we have forgiveness in Christ, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done for us. And so why is it that Matthew is so insistent on being remembered as tax collector? Well, I think it's because Matthew is honest with himself and honest with us because so often we are not honest with ourselves. And we really can't be honest with ourselves because if we were, if we really looked at ourselves without any sort of pretense, without any sort of lies, I think we might be repulsed by what we find. In truth, our condition is much like that in the, in the picture of Dorian Gray. One of, one of my favorite books and also one of my favorite movies. It's the story of a, of a magic painting that Mr. Gray, Mr. Gray has. And upon it, every vice and sin that he committed in his body were safely tucked away on this portrait. But he never looked at it. He never dared to see how marred 
and disfigured this portrait had come because of the sins that he permitted in his flesh, the vices that he excused and indulged in. And we too each have a portrait like that, a portrait that we hide deep away inside for those little sins that aren't consequential, those little lies and half-truths, the things we know we shouldn't do, but we still make excuses so that we can do them. That lustful covetousness of our neighbor's house or his car, those inappropriate images we see on the computer screen or in movies, or maybe even that total an utter disgust we have for that other person that we hate so very much, but we, but we smile and shake their hands and offer words of forgiveness, hollow words, because they are forgiveness only of the lips and not of the heart. And that's why I say, if we're truly honest, if we're truly honest, we don't really want Christ. At least we don't want Christ right next to us. We like Christ right where he is. Where once a week we can come, open up the Bible just a little, read a couple of verses, you know, not so many that we might actually feel condemned in our sin, but enough that we feel appropriately admonished. Just enough that we can keep our own image intact. The truth is that our sins cannot be hidden. They cannot be stuck away on a portrait deep inside that no one knows. Indeed, our sins are bold and our sins are blatant. We can see them. We know they're there. And we fool ourselves into thinking that no one can see them. Except Psalm 90 tells us clearly that Christ, Christ who is the light, in his light our sins are known. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. In the light of Christ, the light of the world, our secret sins are secret no more. And brothers and sisters, you have been baptized. And thanks be to that for the original sin, that stain has been washed clean. And you have received absolution. And you have partaken of the body and blood of Christ, given and shed for the forgiveness of sin. And so, as much as you don't really want Christ next to you, you really do want Christ next to you because you know how sick you are and you know that he can and has made you well. And even though we know these things, even though the new man within us desires Christ and the old man pushes him away, well, there are times when we still shy from him, when we still don't want to be near Christ. See, the old Adam is terrified of being healed. We're frightened of our own sinfulness we're frightened of Christ, who comes to make our secret sins known. We're frightened of Christ, who comes to forgive every sin. See, the things that are hardest for us are very often the things that are best for us. Confessing your sins to your pastor, that under-shepherd of your soul. What if someone knew all of your sins? What if someone knew what a vile and repulsive sinner you are? What a vile and repulsive sinner I am? Well, how would your pastor look at you? Well, hear the words of your under-shepherd, the words that Christ has given him to speak. Your sins are forgiven. As much as God does not remember them, neither do I. Now, if we think how we feel in church when Christ comes near us, 
that sense of both being a little terrified and yearning for his company. But we can think that that might be how Matthew was sitting in his tax booth. He didn't record for us his feelings. We might imagine that that is how it was. Think what it might be if you were a tax collector in the first century. If people knew what you were. No one would say hello. Now they might wave at you. But it wouldn't be to say hi. It might be to say go away. Get out of here. Or maybe even something worse. You would be utterly alone. Now, perhaps Matthew sought this job of tax collector because it was easy money. Maybe it was the only job that he could find. Or maybe it had been a family job for years and years. We simply don't know. But like us, Matthew is a sinner. And he's sitting in this tax booth alone. And along comes Jesus. Jesus, in his state of humiliation, you see, it's not obvious that he is the Christ, God made flesh. But there is something different about him, different about this Jesus. He's healed people. He's made the lame to walk. He has raised people from the dead. He has forgiven sins. And he speaks with authority. He speaks with authority unlike the scribes. Yes, this man Jesus is is certainly different. And as we're sitting in the tax booth, Jesus is walking by. And it looks like he might pass us by. And is this a good thing? Yes. Yes, because we're a tax collector. We are a terrible person. Matthew probably would not want anyone so holy to come near him. But on the other hand, this is the man Jesus. That man so miraculous so wonderful, so unique that we wonder what it would be like to be in his presence. And his eyes turn to the tax booth and he says, pointing directly at us, follow me. Now Christ is the word made flesh. He is both law and gospel embodied in man. He is the full counsel of God. And so when he says, follow me, it's law. It's a command that you will follow me. And so Matthew does. He rises up and he follows, leaving his old life behind without argument, without question. He does exactly as he is told according to the law. But follow me is also gospel. Because here Christ is saying, you I want you. Where I am going, you are welcome also. Come, follow me. And so Matthew, yes, even Matthew the tax collector, that liar, that cheat, that traitor to his people, is worthy of being called by Christ. You are worthy of being called by Christ. He wants you. It is law, yes, you must obey, but it is gospel because you are the most precious thing in the world to Christ. He wants you. And it's no wonder that Matthew throws a feast in his home for Christ, for once we have come and been healed by Christ, that physician of body and soul, had our sins forgiven, would we not want to, sh to share that with everyone we knew? Would not Matthew have held this feast to invite his colleagues, these other tax collectors, and his friends, his friends who are only the worst sinners around because no respectable, righteous Jew would be seen with him? No, all of these friends he would want to bring to meet Jesus. He would want them to meet Jesus because they are the ones who are sick, the ones who need healing just like Matthew did. And Christ comes not for the ones who are well, but for the sick, for you and for me. 
For the well ones, or the ones who suppose themselves well, are like the Pharisees, who stand before God and boast of their works. I tithe. I pray I do good works. Lord, I thank you that I am not like that tax collector. But it is the sick, the sick who know they have no works in which to boast, who say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. They ask for nothing but mercy. And that is what God desires. He desires not sacrifice, not good works, not self-justification. He desires mercy. He desires to give you mercy. And that is the thing that he most wants to do. It's not the holy living you have, not your merits, not your worth, not your donations, not even your worship here in church. What God desires is to give you mercy, to serve you, to heal you, to make you well. That's why he desires you here, to care for you. God desires to make his light, his light to shine upon that secret place in our hearts, to have his light shine on that portrait that is so marred and disfigured, covered by those sins that we dare not confess. And he desires to turn his light on this, to turn our gaze to it as well. For having met Christ, for having been healed by him, we might find that when we look in that portrait, we do not see ourselves, but we see Christ who has made us whole and who has given us his own self. And by his spirit, may we rise and follow him. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.